Hello, everyone, and welcome to InfoSecurity Magazine's webinar on Insider Risk. My name is Kevin Poirot. I'm a reporter at InfoSecurity Magazine, and I'll be your moderator for this session. For the next hour, we are going to discuss how organizations can mitigate insider threats in a hybrid working world. But first, let me go through a few bits of housekeeping. Please note that you can submit any questions using the button at the bottom of the video screen, whether it is a general question or a specific one, even one that is uh, tar targeted specifically to one of our speakers. We'll do our best to answer them uh, before the end of the webinar. Then we will also be running some polls throughout the session, so please do join in with those. There's no right or wrong answers, it's just we want to have your opinion on, on the topic. And also this session is eligible for CPE credits. So member of ISC Squared, EC Council and ISACA can get one CPE credit if they watch 50 minutes of the, of the webinar and half a CPE credit for 25 minutes. In order to claim your credits, you will need to log in to your InfoSecurity Magazine account and download your CPE certificate, which will be available um, two days after your viewing. You are then responsible for submitting this to your accreditation body. For those who are members of other accreditation bodies, every attendee will receive an automated thank you email and you can use this and, and see with, with your accreditation bodies. So let me introduce the session. So as you all know, the way we work has changed dramatically. And the fact that you may be watching this from your bedroom or from your couch is a good example of that. People now work from anywhere and their loyalty to their company has changed. Now that 58% of office workers work from home at least one day a week, threats are even more pronounced for companies and managers find it harder to spot issues. According to IBM, the average data breach from an at-home worker is $1.07 million, higher than in, in 1.7 million dollars higher in 2022 than in 2021. And all industries are concerned, even the most critical ones. In the US alone, over three quarters of critical national infrastructure operators have seen a rise in insider-driven cyber threats in the last three years. Companies have upped their use of employee monitor monitoring, but more is needed to go ahead of the threats. So to discuss this today, to discuss the cost of these insider threats and the challenges that security leaders and business owners face in mitigating the risk with a hybrid workforce, I have with me wonderful speakers with different backgrounds who will complement each other per perfectly and will have a conversation. Uh, but first, let me introduce the panel. So David, do you want to start introducing yourself? Hi, yeah, uh, my name's David Morrow. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Variado, which is an employee monitoring solution providing both uh, productivity and insider risk management uh, uh, opportunities. I'm based in uh, Los Angeles. Great, uh, thank you. Um, Ray, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Uh, my name is Ray DeWalker. I run product and technology at Variado. Uh, I work with David and I am in the East Coast. Right. Ani? Hey, thank you, Kevin. My name is Ani Banerjee and I'm the Chief uh, HR Officer for Know Before. Um, and basically we do security awareness training, you know, phishing simulation, and basically it really is addressing the human firewall. And I'm also based in the East Coast of the U.S. And we also have a Val Letelier, who's Business Development Specialist at Raytheon. I think Val had a small um, tech issue, but I think he's back with us. Val, are you here? I am. I am. So welcome, everyone. My background is a little bit different in that I've got a deep understanding how insiders are created, how they're managed, how they're protected, and they're discovered. And I got this after two decades of working as the Central Intelligence Agency as an operations officer. So my job was to basically recruit, to spot, assess, develop, uh, and then recruit insiders that were penetrating foreign organizations. So I've spent a great deal of time thinking about <clears throat> the background of insiders, uh, what makes them vulnerable, um, and then how to turn that vulnerability into an exploitation. So that's my background. I've also 
developed uh, insider threat programs, designed them, developed them, executed them for large both government organizations and private organizations. So happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, that sounds like it's going to be a very insightful uh, conversation. But first, let me just give the floor to you, David. Uh, you're going to do a presentation on uh, how to get ahead of the threats. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. So, yes. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, the new insider risk playbook and how to get ahead of threats. So, you know, as, as Kevin said in the introduction, uh, since the the onset of COVID, we really have moved into a new era uh, of work. 31% um, of global workers uh, were either remote or hybrid at the end of 2022, uh, according to Gartner. And 58 work from home at least one or more day per week. I myself, as you can see, I'm sitting at home here in, in Los Angeles. I work from home uh, permanently. Um, our headquarters are actually on the East Coast in, in Florida. So I'm 3,000 miles away from our, our head office. But a lot of this um, hybrid and working from home has, has uh, changed some things. There's been a 55% uh, increase in global demand for employee monitoring software to help, um, to help understand uh, how these people are, you know, what they're doing when they're working from home. But it's also led to a 44% surge in insider threats since, uh, since the, the, the large increases in work from home activity. So what does that mean? Well, it presents some challenges for today's business leaders. They're confronted with problems that they haven't had to deal with in the past. You know, the two key problems that, that tend to crop up when we talk to business leaders are declining productivity uh, and increasing uh, insider risk. Hey, the slides have disappeared. Apologies for that. Um, so yeah, so there's some huge benefits to be had from having an engaged workforce. Um, you know, according to um, various different uh, research institutions, well-being, uh, employee well-being increases 66% when uh, when a workforce is engaged. Productivity increases 18%, retention 18 and participation 13%, all very, very positive. And also positives, although they're on the, the negative side, absenteeism drops 81% and cyber risk goes down a huge 42% as well. So huge benefits clearly to be had from having an engaged workforce. But a lot of companies really don't do anything to, to, to ensure that their, their workforce is engaged or to understand whether their workforce is engaged or not. And there's a lot of costs uh, to, do no, to doing nothing. You know, it costs businesses a lot when they don't do these things. Workforce inefficiency um, results in $7.8 trillion in lost productivity worldwide. $450 a year in $450 billion a year in uh, lost revenue and $11 billion a year due to you know, employee turnover with employees not being happy in what they're doing. And of course, cybercrime, which is, you know, a large part of what we're here to talk about today, over $6 trillion in costs, a 600% increase since the onset of COVID-19. And 42% uh, of insider threats involve both IP and data theft. So a huge problem to deal with. So we, as a cybersecurity industry, need to keep up with uh, with today's workforce, whether they're remote, whether they're hybrid, or whether they're on site. So we need to make some changes. So what can we do? Well, the situation is further complicated because there's two different perspectives, the employee versus the employer. Employees have a very different view on working from home um, versus their employers. Employees tend to want to work from home. They feel like they get more flexibility. You know, perhaps they can build things into their regular day, like exercise or so forth, that they may not be able to do when they're commuting to and from an office, or they can work hours that are more suited to them. Um, a work from home market also provides uh, global job opportunities for, for remote workers. You know, as I just mentioned, I, I live 3000 miles away from our head office, but I'm still able to do my job effectively from here. So, you know, employees like that flexibility. And it's often the case that um, work from home employees end up working more and not less. Sometimes the perception is that people work less when they're uh, at home because there are more distractions. But to be honest, 
there's a lot of distractions in an office. And I find that, you know, the hours that I would have spent commuting are now spent productively at home because I have more hours in my day because I'm not spending my time on the freeway. But the employers do have a very different perspective on this. A lot of employers um, don't particularly want work from home. They didn't have a choice when COVID happens, what happened. But, you know, now that we're kind of on the other side of that, um, employee employers are, are feeling a lot more like they want people back in the office. Um, they feel that their IP is less secure when people are working from home and the endpoint of the network is essentially somebody's dining room table or the kitchen table with kids running around and all sorts of different people running around. And, you know, employees also feel that it's harder to keep an eye on workers when it's a, a work from home environment. They don't have that opportunity to stand and look over their shoulder at the screen and what they're doing uh, that they did in, in the office. So, you know, they, they feel that sense that it's harder to, to keep tracks. And of course, their biggest uh, worry is that threats and risks increase with a, with a hybrid or work from home workforce. But it's not going to change. Work from home is here to stay. Uh, you know, uh, according to IBM, organizations incur an additional million dollars per data breach when they have work from home employees. So there are bigger threats to deal with and they need to be dealt with. And in this new normal situation, um, it's really cr uh, critical to have secure, you know, it, it's business critical data security is what is, people are striving for in, in this new normal. It, it's really the aim. How do we deal with the, the situation that we find ourselves in? Well, the challenge, as I just mentioned, a lot of the time, the edge of the network is somebody's living room uh, and it could be uh, data could be exposed to all sorts of people that are passing through and, and different kind of uh, people and situations that don't occur in the in, in the office place, uh, particularly for industries with a lot of that need a lot of regulatory uh, compliance. Um, and it's also very difficult to monitor fraudulent activity when your workforce is distributed. Um, and you don't have as many face to face meetings, you know, for however much we want to say that meetings like this are face to face meetings. They're not really you don't have that same opportunity to just walk past somebody's desk and ask a question or just to keep up to date with something that's going on. So there's there's risks involved there. So from our perspective, the solution to to deal with these problems is, is, is well, is our product Variato, obviously. Um, and that is essentially a non-invasive software that helps keep uh, data secure while respecting the privacy um, of, of your team. And it works for whether you're in the office, whether you're at home or, or wherever you might be. Essentially, it's AI-powered AI behavior analytics to, to help you identify um, where risks might happen and to get out ahead of insider risk before they become threats. So really what we advocate for and, and what we do as, a, as an organization is help companies move from being reactive to insider threats to having a proactive risk management strategy. Um, our software helps people to address the weakest link at a company. And in general, people tend to be any company's weakest link. 60% of data breaches are caused by, by insiders. And a lot of those are not even malicious. A lot of them are actually done inadvertently by through human error. Um, but of course, there are malicious threats as well. But you know, using a software like ourselves does help to address both sides of that coin. Um, you can also use it to use the data that the software provides to cover up blind spots that you might have within your organization. You can monitor, proactively monitor access to sensitive data, to data that needs to be, uh, uh, that needs to be handled in a regulatory compliant manner. And you can get yourself alerted to any suspected malicious activity, whether the employee is at home or whether they're in the office. And that alerting really is the key to, to, to the solution. You know, uh, if, if, if something nefarious is going on, you want to get alerted to the possibility of this before it happens. Once it's happened, it's already too late. And this does allow you to get um, uh, outside and get, a, get ahead of those threats. You know, it's a lot easier to prevent something from happening than it is to deal with the aftermath when it has already happened. And a lot of the time you can tell if there's a risk of something uh, malicious going to happen. Uh, in behavioral patterns, employees' attitudes might change, their behavioral patterns might change, they might start working different hours, they might start downloading a lot of files that they didn't used to download. And all of these types of activities, even the language they use in psycholinguistic analysis, you can tell 
but the language they're using, there's a change in their attitude. And these could all be signals that um, your data could be at risk and a threat could be developing. But this allows you to get out ahead of those before they actually occur. And using a software like what we like what we provide um, helps you reduce risk through insights. You're, you you get a lot of data to to be able to analyze and, and and assess and reduce risks. So you gain a lot better insight in what your into what your employees are doing by monitoring their activity. You can identify negative sentiments in communication that might indicate that they are getting a little bit frustrated with the company and may start looking for another job. And as we all know, when uh, an employee starts looking for another job, they become a risk because they might start downloading data, proprietary data. They might start downloading information and, you know, they become a risk to, to the integrity of your organization. And what we do is we set up alerts to, to let you know when sensitive information is being accessed and not just when it's being accessed, but when it's being accessed in ways that are not normal. You know, there's a baseline that you can set. And um, if, if data is being accessed in a way that is, is that differs uh, to that baseline, then you can get an alert set up to, to, to let you know that that is going on and you can take action to understand what's happening. Um, but this, 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 this software also allows you to, to understand new patterns from work from home employees. You know, the, the nine to five in the office may not be the work pattern that, that work from home employees use. You know, maybe they work from 7 a.m. through till midday, and then they take a couple of hours during the day to, for whatever reason, um, I myself, I sometimes take time out and go for a cycle in the middle of the day because, you know, I tend to start very early because I'm on the West Coast and everyone else is on the East Coast or abroad. So by the time I wake up, my inbox is already flooded and I start right away. Come the afternoon, everyone else is logging off and switching off and I have a little bit more time in my hands. But, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't working and doing their, their, their full jobs. But this, uh, this software allows you to build um, patterns of each employee's work, working day, and what is normal for them, and then can alert you when that working pattern uh, is, is, is changing. And you can use these insights to align different organizations across your business. You can align IT, HR, and managers together uh, to tackle any issues. If, if there is something that looks a little bit strange, um, you can reach out to employees early to ensure that what they're doing is legitimately part of their, their working life uh, and, and isn't actually going to end up being a, a, a threat. Um, and you can identify weak points in your security um, and prioritize where to increase um, your, your activity there to ensure that these risks don't, uh, don't build up. So, so really... Um, what we talk about and what we advocate as part of this playbook for insider risk management is to implement a proactive approach to get out ahead of threats before they turn it before, before to get out ahead uh, of threats um, before they become irreparable and before they cause uh, a lot of damage to the organization. You're essentially managing for insider risk so that it doesn't turn into threats. Um, some of the key things that we we would advise doing. Uh, you know, use machine learning and AI to establish benchmarks for typical activity, set up real time alerts to alert you to when significant deviations occur from the, the baseline benchmarks that you've set up. You can also create risk scores for each employee based on their access level activities and so on. And these risk scores can change over time if they start doing more things that are deemed risky behaviors. And you can trigger notifications based on the likes of psycholinguistic analysis and sentiments expressed in emails um, and, and all of their communications to, to alert you to changes in behavior, which could indicate that they're becoming disengaged and a potential uh, risk uh, to, to the company that you can stop before it becomes a threat. And it also, with all of the monitoring that's going on, this creates digital records of activity and data that can be used to, to demonstrate that data is being used in a compliant manner. It can be used to run audits and, and you can conduct employee investigations. If something nefarious has happened, you can go back and look and see what has actually gone on and where things have gone wrong. So I'm not going to dwell on this slide too much. This is just some of the features that, that uh, we provide that help you put together your insider risk management playbook, uh, risk scoring, baselining, anomaly detection, fully customizable settings, screenshots and screen recording, et cetera, et cetera. 
So all of this together essentially allows you to, to deal with the, this new era of working from home, the hybrid, the, the um, in office together. It brings everything together under one holistic kind of um, experience for you as a business owner um, to be able to get out ahead and have a proactive approach to managing for insider risk, which in turn then prevents insider threats from happening in the first place. So it's all about basically moving from a proactive to a reactive approach. And that was a very, very quick run through of uh, what I wanted to talk about this morning. Great, thank you so much, David. Uh, let me just switch, yeah, screen. Um, so just um, so just before we turn to, uh, to, I turn to the other speakers to, to see what the, um, their comment on the, on your presentation, that was very insightful and, and it gives us a good overview on, on what insider risk is. Um, I'd like to engage with the audience. I'd like to taste, test out the waters with, with you, uh, members of the audience, uh, by asking you whether your organization has ever faced a cyber incident caused by an insider. So I launched um, the poll questions. Um, it will be running for about 10 minutes and then we, we can see what kind of results we get. Okay. Um, and we all actually, David, before we, we start the conversation, we a already question, have, a, yeah, there's a question uh, yeah. from the audience about insider risk because you've been, you, you, you've used insider risk and insider yep. threats. And yeah, uh, I, I, I can take, I can take that question. So the, the question um, for anybody who hasn't seen it, uh, um, is there a difference between insider risk and insider threat, or can these terms be used interchangeably? Um, there is a difference, um, but it's a relatively simple difference. Um, and th that difference is this. Um, a threat is an immediate problem. The problem has already happened, and you have to deal with the consequences and the aftermath of the, of the threat, the problem that has happened. Whereas a risk is a circumstance that gives a possibility that a threat could occur. So when inside a risk, nothing has yet happened, but you're a little bit concerned that something might happen. A threat, it's already happened, it's too late, you're fighting fires. So that is the key difference between insider risk and insider threat. And and do you so do you um include misconfigurations and 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 mistakes from uh, the employees or from from anyone from the, the companies in both of them or is inside the risk including this and not inside the threat? So uh, people tend to think when you say insider threat and insider risk, it sounds very negative and people tend to assume that that is just, um, you, you know, that the sentiment is always malicious when that happens. But the vast majority of insider threats and indeed behaviors, the insider risk that lead to threats are usually inadvertent errors, human errors, you know, but they need to be treated in the same way because these human errors end up with the same results. It could be a loss of IP, it could be a loss of data. Um, and because of that, it could end up in the hands of, of a malicious uh, person. But, you know, so they really do need to be dealt with generally in the same way. When it when it comes to mistakes that are made by employees um, that are risky behaviors, uh, before they become threats, by having a software like we've dis like we've discussed, like Variado, you can you can see these risks and you can address these issues with the employees and say, by the way, we've noticed that you're doing X, Y, or Z, um, and actually those behaviours are a little bit risky, and they may actually end up, and you know they could end up in, a, in creating a, a, a threat for the organisation. So please, can you ensure that you are doing things differently? So you can uh, whether it's malicious or inadvertent need to be treated in the same way but when you're notice, noticing it as a risk you can deal with it before it becomes a threat and and work with that employee to ensure that they are supported and understand why the behavior that they are engaging in uh, is risky mm -hmm. thank you david and and annie i want to turn to you now because uh, one of the premise that we have both uh, talked about david and i is uh, the change from um fully working from the office to hybrid working. Uh, how do you think, how much impact did, has it had to, to inside a risk? I think it's a huge one. And I think David made some really astute comments before. And let me kind of go pre-COVID. And to me, you know, social engineering was a real thing out there for sure. And I was look at the last line of defense as kind of your human firewall and the behaviors that we have, in, you know, as employees. 
And then once we went hybrid, we kind of blurred the lines between the work environment formally and being at home. And, you know, being at home, I could be not locking my computer. I could be leaving confidential information elsewhere. I can go into an internet cafe and using what appears to be a legitimate network, but it's actually a pineapple and is actually extracting data. Um, you know, I may be looking at some personal things on Amazon and getting a phishing, which looks like an Amazon kind of, uh, you know, thing for Prime Day, which is not. So what ends up happening is that from a human firewall perspective, it kind of blurs the lines. And I think it's important for us to, to realize that fact that when you're at home working or you're working travel, traveling, you got to be extra vigilant. Um, you could be in a business lounge having that conversation as well. So I think it's become a real threat. And it's here to stay. It's not like we're going to go back to 2019 and everyone's in the office every single day. So we have to be extra vigilant and definitely making sure that we're training our folks, making them more aware and ensuring that they're conscious of what they're doing to make sure the human firewall is a strong one. Mm -hmm. And Val, uh, you, you're hands on with uh, dealing with uh, insider threats and, and other threats. Does it resonate with your experience? Yes, yes. Um, if you look at the insider threat critical path, which starts with temperament, um, predisposition, goes to a critical event, and then the insider takes some, there's some conflict that evolves, and then they determine to take action, prepare for that action, then actually take it. Uh, you've got all these different stages of a insider action taking place. And then, of course, as David said, uh, the idea is to get to it at the earliest stages uh, as possible, to be as proactive as possible. And of course, with the transition to remote work, this is very challenging because in many cases, many insiders have been identified early in that critical path by fellow workers, by managers, et cetera, who saw them on a regular basis. And as humans, we're, we're quite good at anomaly detection, essentially, in personality. I mean, if you, if you have any questions about this, you know that your, your um, significant other is often like picking up changes in your behavior uh, that maybe you don't even realize or you're picking it up in them. Same thing happened in the workplace when people were around. Of course, going to remote work, you've lost all that. You've lost a degree of uh, observation, but you've also lost a degree of cohesion within the workforce, which is also a, a mitigating factor for insider activity. So all of those things are sort of, you know, essentially out of the window if, if it's full remote. Uh, you're seeing folks, your employees through the prism of a, of a computer screen and a, and a, and a computer camera. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to pick up the nuances in that way. And you're only getting a chance to see their representative. You're not getting a chance to see them in the sort of the full spectrum. Um, I would add just real quick that uh, Carnegie Mellon University has a series, I think it's about 20 points that they make as being sort of the best practices of uh, insider threat or insider risk mitigation. And about five of them are directly impacted by remote work. I mean, one of them's consistently enforced policies and controls. One is monitor, respond to suspicious or disruptive behavior, anticipate and manage negative issues in the work environment. And it goes on. All of those things go out the window when you when you don't have your employees directly in an observable state. So, uh, yes, very much uh, believe that there is a significant paradigm shift that has occurred with the remote work, the hybrid work change. I'll leave it at that. If I may add to if I may add to what Val said, Val, I think a uh, long time ago you had mentioned something about social shrinking where even in an observable environment, you have people who are apathetic to behavioral changes. This has actually exponentially changed by, you know, it's now social blind spots and social, social ap apathy, right? Because you're not actually in any kind of an observable environment. So you're not really paying attention to some of the security things that you would normally follow in a, you know, in a business setting, right? So this has become a little bit more involved when it comes to people being, uh, you know, when you're in an office environment, you're actually following a certain patterns, right? Social patterns, security patterns. Mm -hmm. and, and what, 
so you, uh, David, said earlier that uh, it's not always uh, a malicious actor. Obviously, it's it's a lot of misconfigurations and mistakes. But when it's when it is like a, a, a malicious, maybe not active, but malicious behavior, what kind of motivations uh, are there behind such an act, and what is at stake? What is that like? Do we need to be careful of uh, uh, the the critical data, personal data? Uh, do they try usually to um, disrupt the system? How how does it usually plays out? Okay. Ray, do you want to take this one? Oh, sure. Um, so, so again, you know, I think uh, I will actually quote Annie. Annie, you had actually mentioned something about poor data practices, right? So when out of sort employees, that is essentially one of the fundamental flaws when it comes to you know, how data is handled. You know, I'll give you an example. One of the um, our customers, they mentioned something about, you know, when a customer support person is talking to a customer, they usually, you know, use a notepad to type down the account number, the passwords, you know, their credit card information on a notepad, leaving it, you know, open while they are actually trying to resolve the customer issue. That kind of behavior is not something that you would normally see in a in a work environment. But at home, it is sort of almost like a you know it's okay for me to actually go ahead and write somebody else's credit card or right. So that level of poor data practices is something that has definitely uh, you know increased in terms of uh, um, you know insider risk. That's that's one thing. The other thing is like you know how we can raise awareness. It's something that you know as part of the tooling and as part of education. If we can actually go ahead and allow employees to follow the same type, kind of rigid security protocols they would follow in a business environment, that work. But it doesn't always help when you have everybody remote and you're not actually following through with all this training and so on. So that's something that, you know, what we have done is we have focused on the behavior aspects where we're starting to see, you know, it, it always has a pattern that you can actually predict. You know, if a you know there is absenteeism, or if there is uh, you know productivity loss, or if there is you know the the employee has actually gone to a job website, and you know that those are the things if you can actually see the pattern, you'll automatically see very clearly that there is a risk involved, right? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that can be predicted ahead of time by looking at not only just the user, but also you know looking across the entire company and see how normal patterns occur, and. You know, everybody. Everybody's talking about generative AI, right? Everybody says, "Oh, generative AI is going to actually help us, uh, you know, uh, combat these insider risk issues." But on the flip side of it is that generative AI is actually going to be the cause of that issue. How do you even stop that? That is one of the things that, uh, you know, these behavior patterns will help in some ways because if you actually know the pattern of a language or something that the user is using. You can actually say that okay, this is not generated by this human, but it's generated by an artificial intelligence. So those are some things that are absolutely critical in order to combat this insider risk. Ani, I can see you. You you nodding. Uh, you want to <laughs> add anything to that? Yeah, uh, Ray, you're you're absolutely spot on. And I think you know some of the things that I see that you know that you know the blurring the line between the so-called work environment and the physical office and home makes sense. And one of the things that, you know, I think helps is, you know, and just it's hybrid. It could be you're in three days a week, you're in there two days a week, you're fully remote. And when you look at really looking at training your employees to identify and see kind of what it looks like and doing phishing simulations, if you kind of like literally I get something which is actually planted by my infosec, which looks like something I need to approve from DocuFace or whatever. If I don't hover over that link and I click on that, you know, you, it's kind of a safe way to learn about it. So I think that by educating your employees, with simulations and showing kind of what it, it really looks like, it's super important. And even being able to report it. So for example, let's say we're all working together. I may get a particular note and I'm able to identify that's phishing or whatever it may be. If I'm able to notify InfoSec, they can actually block or make sure nobody else gets it. So when Ray gets back to his desk or David, they're not experiencing the same thing as well. So there are things that we can do for employees on the human firewall, but is also from InfoSec how they can kind of help proactively get ahead of it. And those are things, whether you're in the office regularly, whether you're at home, that's going to help get some of that awareness there where, wait a second, I was on my computer, personal computer raising on something on Amazon, that thing in my work account is actually not really Amazon. So 
Um, those are things that'll, that'll help. And again, it's mitigating. It's never going to hundred percent prevent it. Mm -hmm. And and we do have a, a question from from a member of the audience, and I want to I want to turn it to turn to you, Annie, because uh, your chief human resources officer. Um, that that person said uh, the biggest threat to a company is not employees. The biggest threat is management. Would you agree yeah. with that? Well, well I, I, let me qualify. To me, we're all employees, whether you're executive, you know, so every single, I'm as much of a risk, maybe even more <laughs> than as the tech support person is probably a lot more tech savvy than the, than the old HR dude. So, you know, we're all employees at the end of the day, but I think it's a yes and where every single one of us as employees and part of that human firewall, we need to make sure that we are trained, we're aware, we see the different signs and we're agile about it. But actually for management, this is also something that I think is really important. Um, and if I look at the remote part of it as well, I'm going back to previous organizations where it's incumbent upon us for leadership to understand the value of what a person's doing remotely. So if I make the assertion that, you know, oh, my employee's doing nothing sitting there in Seattle, well, what am I doing to setting the right OKRs and expectations and measuring it and really looking at the work, having regular platforms for, for interaction, be it through formal one-on-ones, through Slack, through group meetings. So I think to the comment that was made there, I agree that it's not going to substitute for management, that we can do all the training we want and have the great software that we just talked about from Ray and David. But if we as leadership are not proactively engaging, seeing the, like, you know, the engagement levels, what David showed is spot on. And unless we are spending time and concerted effort to see the engagement levels and saying, wait a second, Sally's dropping off, not showing up for the meetings, her language has changed, her attitude, well, that may you know, have a potential risk there as well. So it is really, we got to work harder as leadership when people are remote you know, or they're, they're, they're hybrid because it's easy to walk down the hall and see Sally doesn't look like she's doing as well versus Sally working out of Seattle. So I think there's validity to that, but I just want to clarify that each and every one of us are employees uh, and we're, you know, at risk like anyone else. Mm -hmm. And and Val, you you mentioned um, you mentioned the Carnegie Mellon uh, principles. Do you find it harder to have the the, the leadership uh, people from a company uh, engage with these and and implement these than the, the employees, or do you? What would you say is is, is the risk uh, lying more on on the employee side or on the managerial side? Well, I think uh, the core issue here is getting leadership buy-in and stakeholder buy-in mm -hmm. on on the on the countermeasures um, that need to be taken to address some of these this overall risk and specific threats. That is, that is one of the biggest challenges. And, and for example, as we look at a whole person, a whole threat approach, you may want to bring in some form of public data. And for example, um, arrest records, court records, et cetera. Um, and the, the sort of the, the, the far end of that spectrum would be public facing social media. And this is a big debate in companies. Some are very, very reluctant to go down that path. But at the end of the day, when you look back on some of these major insider events, particularly those that are in the government space, you see that there are life stressors that have existed. And those life stressors are, can be detected uh, by looking at public data sources and seeing things like bankruptcy, things like arrest records, things like, you know, other uh, arrests, uh, maybe a, a, a court, um, a legal struggle that some of your employees involved in. And again, the idea here is to get in early to see that this employee is vulnerable and maybe distressed and to engage them in a, in a very positive manner, which converts not just to keeping that employee on the on the straight path, but other employees see that and see that this is a company or an organization that really cares about its people. So the idea is um, to create a very positive security culture, uh, one in which you are essentially addressing employee welfare at the end of the day. And this will have significant payoff um, you'll have a stronger security culture, but you'll also uh, reduce attrition. Uh, so it's valuable in today's tight labor market uh, to approach things in a, in a, in a very sort of uh, transparent and positive and collaborative manner. I'll leave it at that. 
<laughs> Thank you. And, and, and yeah, uh, it's it's important uh, to 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 speak about uh, the the well-being, the, the employee well-being, and um, and on at that, I, I would like to uh, take a deep dive on on what workforce behavior uh, analytics is, because I think it's something that we've touched on uh, a few times uh, throughout the session. But um, Ray, could you explain to us uh, what it what it is, and also? How do you use this in a in a smart way, and uh, but while respecting the privacy of your employees and the well-being of your employees? Absolutely. Um, and for that, I will quote Val again. Val, you had actually called something like an early warning system, right? Which is uh, essentially effective and is you know very efficient and uh, more like a red flag methodology that you had mentioned in one of your articles. This is exactly what uh, workforce behavior analytics is subtle behavioral changes. It doesn't have to be like major, like, you know, I do agree Val about, you know, external stressors uh, and social media data, all those things are actually um, additional enrichment to the data that you can have. However, you know, you can actually predict a behavior based on like subtle changes, you know, they missed meetings or they, uh, their language was more, uh, was something that changed in their language. They're much more uh, you know, negative in their uh, in their statements. So those are all things that potentially have a behavioral uh, impact, right? So if you look at productivity, if you look at absenteeism, if you look at you know language uh, that they're using, um, if uh, you look at how they're impacting their their colleagues, all those are behavior behavior patterns that you can actually model. And what it is is like a baseline behavior, right? You know, you actually have certain groups. Uh, performing in a certain way and you can either compare it among the group or you can actually compare it just by what the user has done for the last 30 days 20 days you know last week so that behavior constantly checking on that behavior will help identify beforehand if something goes wrong and that's what behavior analytics is all about it doesn't mean that we are actually using workforce behavior analytics to actually go ahead and identify problem employees it is to identify how you can actually help an employee be uh, more productive and you know, follow the regulatory requirements that you have as a company when it comes to security, educate them. You know, simple things like I was mentioning the example about you know, writing down credit card. It doesn't mean that you have to reprimand the employee and say, don't, you, know, you should not have done it and fire the employee. It is just to educate them on the fact that they cannot do that because it's on a you know, public network, or if it is something that, you know, they forget to say, you know, close and, and delete the file, it's still there sitting on their screen. So those are all things, behaviors that you can actually educate the employees to help them. This, you know, workforce behavior analytics, this level of uh, monitoring behavior at a very minute level is a perfect predictor for what could happen, right? Most of the solutions that are out there are, you know, reactive, Like right? Something happened, oh my God, we lost a file. Right, somebody copied a file. Instead of that, you have a much more of a proactive approach where you can continuously evolve, where you close out all your, some of your blind spots that you might have. Like the day, you know, in part of the David's uh, presentation that we talked about blind spots that you could improve in terms of processes. You can close gaps that are there in your uh, regulatory chain. Those are all things that we actually talk about when we, uh, you know, we, we think about when we talk about uh, behavior analytics from a workforce. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why we didn't say employee behavior is because workforce includes your vendors, your partners, anybody else who has access, access to your network. It is just not one user or employee that is using our systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have, a, in the audience, we have a very different experiences uh, with, with insider threats because uh, um, our first poll question, uh, the results were 33% said that they, they uh, suffered from uh, insider, like cyber attacks from an insider uh, mm -hmm. person several times. 16% said once, and then the rest said no or not sure. Is that something, is that a result that uh, surprises you? <laughs> I think it's going to get worse, I would say. <laughs> this is just the beginning, uh, you know, especially with uh, all the things that are happening with AI, uh, the generative AI side is incredibly scary, um, how it can potentially disrupt what, uh, you know, everybody is sort of sitting back and saying, oh, we have everything that we need for cybersecurity, but the generative AI is going to completely append that whole 
uh, you know, picture. Mm -hmm. And and I've launched another another poll question about. Uh, I want to ask, wanted to ask the the audience, what are the challenges that maybe uh, or the constraints that they face when they they want to maybe um, up their level of uh, of uh, mitigating <coughs> cyber threats. Uh, one so far, one of the, the 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 answers that was given the most was uh, lack of resources. Uh, Val, is that something that you've seen, like uh, people tell you, uh, we would like to do this and that, but we don't have the budget? Or maybe absolutely. the people? Both, both. Um, absolutely. Uh, there is no doubt that security is sometimes viewed as a cost center rather than part of the growth strategy of a company. And this is where the, the attrition and the retention rates uh, become a good a rallying point. Um, again, the idea is to turn this into a very sort of positive engagement for the workforce. The workforce in general is getting more and more um, less and less interested in any sort of um, they're they're more inclined to to want privacy. They're they're more inclined to want flexibility. Um, so again, the security, the insider risk program needs to adapt to that. Uh, and really, I think one of the strongest cases you can make with uh, senior leadership is about retention. And in today's market, you can you can definitely uh, qualify and quantify the, the the changes that would occur by losing a certain amount of people every year that you would not lose if you had a positive security culture. So I think that's the point to make. Another point that I would like to add is um, security generally is considered an IT problem. I think it's a HR and an IT problem. It's just not IT. Uh, 100%. I, I, mean. <laughs> 100%. Uh, I, I, I can just vigorously shake my head. It really is a human firewall. And you can build the best software and we, we have a lot of great analytics. But if we're not doing it on the human side to educate employees, and the comment that gentleman made before in terms of the whole management, like how are managers really engaging to figure out what's going on with their employees? The analytics are going to say one thing, but engagement is going to you know, identify that as well. So I think this is as much an HR human issue as it is an IT no, no doubt. And aside from uh, the solutions, aside from uh, the, the the list of uh, good practices or, or, or best practices um, that we talked about, what could be the, the, the maybe top three quick wins that you could make to maybe mitigate a bit or, or maybe start addressing uh, inside of threats? Annie, I can you want to take this? Oh, yeah. Now, I can block Variado, but uh, I said I'm going to let, <laughs> let Ani <laughs> pitch in. Yes. So if I if I kind of put the, the, the people side being the, the, the HR officer, so I'm going to be obviously biased in that one. It's really about constant education and learning. You got to make sure like these threats just keep changing every six months. And, you know, with with AI, it's going to be even scarier things. So the more that we can educate make folks aware, regardless of where they're working, uh, making sure that we have levels of engagement and even have ways of them reporting and working in partnership with InfoSec. Like, you know, I've not, never worked so close with in Info Security ever in my career, where it's gonna be, here's some of the things that we're seeing, they're able to proactively pull things out, block lists and a whole bunch of other things. So I think that as long as we're able to teach, learn, work with our IT and InfoSec partners, that's gonna help us a lot. And back to the point about engagement, like we got to figure out the people that are disgruntled or things have changed. You know, how are we going to really understand what's going on there, proactively engaging and seeing, you know, what's going on? So it really is a is a people thing. It is a learning thing. It's a culture thing. And it's a management thing as well. Mm -hmm. Val, do you have any quick wins that you can share? With yeah, partners? I would add I would add that you need to involve the general counsel, legal staff, um, Things are changing dramatically in the in the sort of in the privacy realm, um, and you need to have for insider risk programs. You need to have a structured approach that eliminates personal bias, that takes everything, and uh, you're not going to survive if in in a boardroom or in a courtroom uh, if your insider risk analysts are are operating on gut instinct. They have to operate on a, uh, you know, a standardized risk scoring system, hopefully one that um, 
the personal identities of the employees is masked at a certain at most levels um, so that this can survive into the future where we have a greater concern about privacy and individual employee rights, let's call them. And and uh, for you, whose responsibility is it to standardize this? Is that should we should we ask something like the NIST or, or a government body or government agency to do that, a standardization body? Should it be at the level of uh, each uh, enterprise, each organization? Or, or who should standardize have these set of principles? Well, outside of the government, um, you know, in the U.S., we have uh, the Trusted Workforce Initiative, uh, which is looking to standardize continuous vetting, et cetera, particularly for the cleared space. But in, pri in the private sector, there is no standardization or forcing function uh, that is, is really across the board. And I'm not sure that it, private industry would find one acceptable. Mm -hmm. Annie, I, I see you nod again. <laughs> you agree with that? You no, know, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, it's ideal. Is, you know, you have it like here's a government rubric, but I think we're going to have every uh, country, company, industry, and that's going to keep evolving. And you know, the, the one factor that people don't always look at is profiling. So, for example, if I'm in an HR finance shop, I'm going to be exceptionally targeted for approving or doing different things. So, forget about whether I'm really aware and educated. Just by profile of the work that I do, you know, or I'm an infosec or an IT analyst, I'll be at greater risk. So I think that it's really going to depend upon your industry, your country, some of your privacy laws, and that's going to keep evolving. So unless we intend to have something which is updated every six months, it probably said that we got to, I mean, we can share best practices as, you know, as companies, but I think it's really a company and industry part that we got to look at. Um, government does play a role. But I don't. I agree with uh, Val that one size is not going to fit all, and, and even if it did at one point, it'll probably change five minutes later. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and we, we've we've mentioned uh, generative AI, and there's something that I've seen uh, recently in the in the news that uh, people people impersonating uh, someone or creating like loads of uh, fake profiles that are very well crafted and trying to get into security jobs or even other jobs in uh, in any any kind of organizations so an insider threat can actually be an outsider that that managed to get in um is there anything else that we can do to prevent that because uh, that's something that we we're probably going to see more and more with the with the deep fakes and uh, and the fake profiles that are so well crafted with uh, great images, great text, uh, and everything. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, again, I'll keep plugging back the same thing, which is the workforce behavior analytics, is that the subtle changes that we can observe and, um, you know, combating AI with AI essentially uh, is what uh, we have been looking at, which is, you know, an AI can immediately detect if, you know, the language is different from what the user has been using, or if the, you know, in some cases, the AI is even sophisticated enough to see which is a deep fake, all right? Those are some things that we can actually go ahead and, uh, you know, immediately catch as a risk. And as well, well mentioned, you know, have a, a company-wide risk coding methodology that is followed where there is a threat level that can be immediately acted upon. You know, DLP solutions, which, uh, you know, basically are a offset of insider risk. Uh, you know, using behavior analytics would essentially, you know, block uh, users from taking an incorrect action, whether it is malicious or, you know, oftentimes it is not malicious by accidentally they click on a link, right? So those are some things that we can easily prevent from users from, you know, making a mistake, uh, you know, oftentimes not a, you know, deliberate mistake. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's something else that feel like, I feel like resonates with uh, with this is, Obviously, it's for some it's a buzzword, but it's it's uh, used a lot in in cybersecurity these days. Is zero trust networks and zero trust architecture? Um, is that well? Maybe first for those who don't know, could you could you explain uh, in in a few words what it what it is? And also, could it be the way forward as well, uh, along with other solutions like workforce uh, behavior analytics and and more training, uh, more uh, focused training on on insider risk. Could zero trust help in that in that regard? Um, 
was the question directed to me or uh yeah you know. yeah if anyone who won't take <laughs> no, it well, well you, you want to take that i'm i'm happy to actually pitch, jump in no I, w- I will just make a quick comment then i'll turn it over to you um i think that you you might want to reverse it meaning that the risk scoring i think will help enable zero trust methodologies and that's where i think it's most helpful could you just explain uh, in in a few words what zero trust is <laughs> if someone doesn't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, you know, you have heard of multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication, six-factor authentication. You have all kinds of authentication. Essentially, uh, zero trust is what it actually stands for, which is even if you say you're Kevin, I won't trust you unless and until you give me a set of things that I, that, uh, I can verify to make sure that you are who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you know, in a in a human environment, it can prevent uh, malicious actors to get access to certain systems, but a generative AI can actually go ahead and spoof that too, to an extent. So a zero trust architecture supports, to some extent, it can prevent from uh, outsiders from getting in or an insider, uh, you know, ability to access certain sensitive uh, data, but it doesn't completely stop from anybody infiltrating your systems. Okay. So that is where, you know, we feel like zero trust, you know, like what uh, Val said, is perfectly a perfect example. It enables, risk scoring enables zero trust, right? Because it actually prevents something from happening by, you know, your company level threats that you can actually go ahead and set as part of your levels, where it will automatically prevent anybody from getting it. But mm-hmm. both are important, both are necessary. You know, absolutely, the security, uh, those are all technological solutions that you definitely need to have in order to make sure that you have like the groups and the roles who who has access to what set of uh, data you know uh, all that is absolutely critical you know and obviously really uh, secure data practices are also going to be important however combination of all these different solutions is the only approach in which you can actually go ahead and have uh, a preventative scenarios mm-hmm. And we, we have a last uh, question from, from the audience. Uh, someone ask, is asking how important an employee well-being practices in reducing the chances of, how important are employee well-being practices in reducing the chances of insider threats occurring? So we, we have touched on, on this uh, a little bit, but um, uh, Annie, if you want to ask, if you want to answer this this one. Yeah, I think it's a huge one that we shouldn't, you know, uh, shouldn't underestimate at all. I mean, there's definitely programs Programmatic things in terms of, you know, your EAP, you know, having good mental health programs, you know, making sure even for physical and David used a great example that, you know, you're working in, you know, LA and middle of the day, you're going to take some time to go for, let's say, a bike ride. How do we make sure if we have our, let's say, our health and wellness fiscal offering, it's not just, oh, there's a gym in the basement of our headquarters, but wherever you are internationally and globally, what is the norm in that country? What's going to help people go there? Or, or how do you have a programmatic network to help them? So make sure it's scalable, it's international. So there's the fiscal health, there's the mental health um, programs in that one, there's EAP, and there's last going to be really managers engaging and understanding the whole employee and your colleague. It's not just, you know, your direct report is a worker, but they've, you know, what's going on in their life, not trying to divulge confidential information. What's important to them? What are they going through? What support can you give them? And I think a great point that David made earlier on was that, you know, when you work from home, it's not like, oh, people are hardly working. It's often they work longer hours, start early, you know, Mm -hmm. come, you know, finish later because that laptop is still engaged on their, you know, dining room table versus when you walk away from the office, you can physically close it up. So we have to make sure that we're like, how are you doing? Like, I'm seeing you kind of logging in doing stuff like are, are things are okay. How can I help you? And, you know, can we prioritize? Can I help with some of the work? And that starting of the conversation will allow that employee and their manager to kind of help and manage it. So there's some programmatic employee health you know, wellness, mental health, physical, but there's also the practices of really good management and engaging. And it's tougher when they're remote, but, you know, to David's numbers back there, you've got really engaged employees. It's going to be not, you know, having that kind of burnout. So to me, it's both programmatic and really building manager capability of engaging and making sure they're proactive about it and owning that relationship. Well, that's a very great uh, positive comment to to end on. Uh, I, I can see that time is running out. I just want to ask uh, each and every one of you uh, 
if, if you could tell me how do you think inside the risk and inside the threats will evolve in the next three years in, in one word, what would it be? Annie, if you want to start? AI. <laughs> you stole my line. Please, both sides. Please, please don't always, don't all say AI. <laughs> That's what I just said. I was going to use AI, but okay. I only actually used it up. <laughs> okay. Well, two uh, AIs. David, uh, no, how would you? No? You, you have another one? No, I, I definitely Proacti can. I, proactivity. I, proactivity. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The key to key is very much, I think, still something that's very basic, which is understanding your employees, knowing your employees. And risk scoring and AI is going to help with that at the end of the day. You're going to be able to identify folks that are having problems uh, in their lives. And that that is really a very good thing. And that's probably the best step forward we all can make collectively to reducing insider risk. And I would right. yeah. add yeah. data-driven decisions because everything boils down to data. AI is nothing without data. Mm -hmm. Having that data, collecting the data is absolutely critical in actually predicting behaviors. Great. Thank you, everyone. That's that's all the time we have uh, for today. Um, I just want to thank you all and um, all the speakers and everyone from the audience. And um, I want to tell you, please don't miss out uh, our next webinar on collaborative intelligence to build phishing resilience. It's on the 27th of July, and it will be moderated by my colleague, James Coker. Until then, that's a goodbye from me. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Bye -bye. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.